misadvised. She's got the news. She talks with newsmakers. She encourages us to laugh. And she cries with us. Speaking truth to power and questioning authority daily, it's the Nicole Sandler Show. All right. Welcome to a Wednesday, everybody. And uh, it's a busy, busy news day. Now, we knew uh, we were going to hear something from the Facebook Oversight Board um, regarding Donald Trump's future on Facebook. And sure enough, 9 o'clock sharp this morning, um, I I had uh, CNN on, and here's what happened there. This. Breaking news this hour. At any moment, we will learn if former President Trump will be allowed back onto Facebook. Facebook's oversight board is publishing its decision any moment. We'll bring that to you as soon as we have it. It's an interesting makeup on this board. You've got a former prime minister of Denmark, former editor-in-chief of The Guardian, a former Nobel Peace Prize laureate from Yemen. A combination of voices there. We'll see where they come down. No matter the decision, it will have significant social and political consequences. Remember, the former president was suspended the day after the January 6th insurrection. This overpost that many felt incited the deadly violence, certainly refused to call them off. Will he now be banned forever? The controversy over Facebook's power growing. Hours ago, Trump launched a message board of his own, (laughs) the platform (laughs) boasting to be a place for him to, quote, speak freely and safely and perhaps Mm. raise money freely. We have a team of journalists and analysts covering this momentous decision. We begin with CNN Chief Media Correspondent Brian Stelter. Brian, uh, you know, I don't want to get you to uh, make a bet on where this decision will go, but but perhaps, perhaps you could tell us the significance of it. This is about what's acceptable on online platforms that are privately controlled and who decides. And Jim, as you were coming to me, we do have the decision. I can read you the first sentence. It says the board has upheld Facebook's decision to restrict then President Donald Trump's access to posting content. So in other words, Trump remains banned from Facebook. He will not be allowed back on the site. This is a remarkable example of a private platform run by Mark Zuckerberg. Okay, Uh, that's enough of CNN. In fact, let's um, bring on a better expert. Uh, An old friend of the show, haven't spoken to in a while, uh, Tim Carr of freepress.net. What what is your title over there, Tim? You're like... um, Um, Well, (laughs) it's... The current title for me is Senior Director of Strategy. So um, it means basically I do a lot of things. You do a lot of things. And (laughs) and we go back so many years um, and we haven't spoken in a while. So thank you for for coming on today and welcome back. It's always great to hear from you, to see you. So what happened today? Tell us basically what this was about. Uh, We know. uh, But today was the culmination of a four months decision that should have taken all of 15 minutes really to decide okay um the facebook oversight board which is in your lead in mentions about 20 very credible individuals you know nobel laureates and professors of free speech and uh in uh, various uh human rights and legal matters uh who uh, were formed um out of the uh, uh the largesse the generosity of Mark Zuckerberg. He created a $130 million trust that created this entity, which is supposedly independent, even though they're all getting paid six figure incomes out of this Facebook trust. Really? Wow. Yes, for very uh, little work. And um, and they um, came together that um, uh, um, they've only been active for uh, uh, about half a year now, but they, one of the first cases they've already decided on a couple of other cases was uh, in response to Facebook's January 7th decision to not ban, but what they say it, uh, indefinitely suspend, suspend Donald Trump. Right. And, uh, and that was after Trump had tweeted in support uh, of the insurrection um, on January 6th. Okay. Um, so it so that so they so anyway they came together and they made this decision to uphold the ban, but then they asked they booted it back to Facebook and said, "But can you? We'll give you six months to determine what um, indefinitely ban or indefinitely <laughs> suspend means." Right. Um, and so the, in many ways, uh, um, and Margaret Sullivan of of uh, 
uh, of the Washington Post and Kara Swisher of the New York Times both said that they're like passing the hot potato. Right. Uh, because they say, look, you know, we don't really want to make a definite decision here. Facebook, you do it. So these no. 20 people are being paid six figures each yeah. to be an independent oversight board. And, they, and they're given this uh, uh, this assignment and they come back after all this time and say, uh, we don't have clear enough guidelines as to how to rule on this. So we'll keep the suspension for another six months and send it back to you, Facebook, for you to come up with better rules. Is, is that basically what happened? It, it's basically what happened. And in, in many ways, it's a demonstration. And the whole premise, let, let, let's just start from the beginning. The whole premise of having a Supreme Court for a private company is ridiculous. <laughs> yes. Um, the, we have rules and regulations that are called rules and regulation. They're, they're laws that are decided by government and they're imposed by various regulators. There are a lot of proposals out there. Some of them are good, some of them are bad about how to rein in the immense power of Facebook. There is no company in the history of the world that can boast 2.7 billion regular users. I mean, right. this ha this is a new thing that has the potential to incite riots and undermine democracy. Mm -hmm. um, and as we have seen that, we have seen it being used by People, not only Donald Trump, but tyrants in the Philippines, uh, in Myanmar, and elsewhere to incite violence against those that uh, these these powerful dictators don't like. So right. um, it is a dangerous tool. Um, it shouldn't be up to this supposedly independent um, oversight board, 20 individuals receiving six-figure incomes from Facebook, to make these weighty decisions. And I agree with you, but the question is, who then should it be up to? This is a whole new animal. You know, uh, 10 years ago, I know Facebook was there 10 years ago, but didn't have the reach and the power that it does now. And we saw, we see the power of Facebook all the time. We saw it on, on January 6th. We see it constantly. We saw it in, in Trump's election and the fact that he was able to turn out 73 or 4 million uh, people to vote for him. Um, that's why they were so... So, uh, you know, putting so much stock in getting reinstated because Trump <laughs> inconceivably is still the titular head of the Republican Party. Go figure. And and he needs this. And without it there, he's he's hindered a little bit. Um, but it's this it's this new entity, this powerful uh, being that's everywhere and who does have the right to regulate it? I mean, it's not its not even limited to one country. It's a global right. thing, but it is a private company owned by Mark Zuckerberg and, and stockholders, I guess. This is a weird, it's a new animal, right? It is, but it, but it also, there are existing laws, right? Mm -hmm. We have antitrust laws mm -hmm. in the United States to deal with a company that has become too large and powerful. Uh, and there, there are people within the Justice Department who oversees the antitrust who are taking a serious look at Facebook. They're not only taking a serious look at Facebook, they're look, taking a serious look at Google, which yes. controls search. They're taking a, a serious look at Amazon, which controls online advertising. All of these companies are also dominant in the online advertising market. Right. Um, and they have, they have, uh, they control online advertising what's happened as you know because you're a veteran of of traditional media right is that uh, as soon as they came along and dominated online advertising revenues for traditional media media that actually produced journalism <laughs> right right up right. and so not only have we created these monsters and in the case of facebook a monster that spreads disinformation about covid 19 a monster that spreads disinformation about the election results and that incites uh, ri racists and fascists um, to violent acts against people. Um, but they all they are earning money um, at the expense of the sort of tradition, the traditional media outlets and the journalism enterprises that would debunk a lot of this, these lies and information that would challenge um, the corporate power of these tyrants and the corporate or, or the, 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 the the political power of these tyrants and the corporate power 
of these large companies. So we have a dilemma and we have a number of solutions. I mentioned antitrust, Uh but we've also proposed taxing the online advertising revenues of these companies to create what's called the public interest media endowment that would then fund the antidote. The the antidote, okay. It lies in disinformation. That would be journalism, fund public interest journalism out of taxes on the advertising dollars of these large giants. Of course, um, 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 that proposal is, is something that Free Press has put forward and, and is being taken very seriously. Now, t- Tim Carr, again, as we said, it's been a while since we've spoken, but we spent a lot of time on the air together over the years talking yes. about things such as net neutrality. Um, haven't heard that term in a while. Um, and and everything has been turned upside down and inside out. The whole uh, business model is, is everything is different now because of the reach of the Internet. And one of the questions is should the internet be regulated like a utility because that's basically what it's become but we have people running these companies on it and making decisions let me give you a prime example of what we're up against here me as a independent media outlet um i push my show out i audio stream audio and i stream video i stream video to uh well i was streaming to youtube facebook twitter and twitch I'm now suspended from YouTube uh, because from streaming live on YouTube for 90 days because I guess one of their bots or or somebody went back to a show from 2015 and buried deep in the show, I played a green news report. So it wasn't even, you know, it was a break I took. I played a green news report and the bumper music they used at the end of the green news report was a Don Henley song. 30 seconds of a Don Henley song. This is the second time I've been hit by Don Henley song. I used one, a different one, I Will Not Go Quietly, to punctuate a news story about Elizabeth Warren when it was the still she persisted thing. Um, I used it as a punctuation mark, got suspended from streaming for three months for daring to play 20 seconds of a Don Henley song. The thing is, they won't even tell you Right. what your offense was they're just saying you're gone for 90 days i went through and listened to the show the minute i heard don henley i'm like okay that's what it was but they don't tell you what it was no. my husband has been suspended twitter took down his account facebook suspended him linkedin suspended him now you know he he tends to be passionate like i am but they don't tell you what your offense is and they can just cut you off they're yes, and- I mean, one of the things that, that Free Press is involved in is an organization called Change the Terms, mm. which is to change the terms of service uh, that these these online platforms have to include things like due process. You yes, know, please. There are legitimate cases. It doesn't sound like yours are, are, no. are them. It sounds like you were well within the realm of fair use. Um, there are legitimate cases for deplatforming people, right? But you have to be transparent about that process. If you are going to take down someone for organizing racist uh, violence against people, um, and, I mean, which is, seems very legitimate, a very legitimate action. Yes, deplatform that individual. You you also have to be very transparent about that process, right? You have to tell them what the offense was, and they yes. don't. They don't. And, and, and Facebook has hired tens of thousands of content moderators, and they're usually in sweatshops, underpaid, um, having to review mountains and mountains of material uh, and making decisions that some can seem very arbitrary. So one of the yes. things that the Change the Terms Coalition has asked for is, is due process, uh, an appeal process whereby the platforms have to make their case. So at the very least, the very least, you understand why um and and can have you know can have your case reconsidered uh right but th- but again it was pulling teeth to get youtube to respond to me to say what was the content that violated uh the copyright what what was my offense and th- they don't feel like they have to tell you and again i went and right. found out myself just by listening back to the the podcast the audio podcast that i had <laughs> still from five years ago because they took down the video so i couldn't even go back and watch the video to find out what it was it's so it's unilateral and they say you're out of here 
Well, that's that's what they were doing to him um, now on, on LinkedIn, of all places. They don't tell you why. So it's very one sided there. It seems like it's the Wild West. And he who holds the keys decides how it goes. Obviously, that can't fly for too much longer. Well, it, the problem with these platforms is that they've, they, they've emphasized growth. Mm-hmm. So now that you, ha- you have Facebook with 2.7 billion active members, right? Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, the old saying from the, uh, the financial crisis was that these banks were too big to, to fail. fail. Right. Um, and it, the opposite is true for Facebook. It's too big not to fail. Right. Um, there is no way it can manage the amount of content. This is true for YouTube. It's true for the other large platforms. There's no way that they can manage the amount of content that's flowing across their pipes in a way that's fair and equitable. Um, and some have said, well, they should just not manage it and have it be a free for all. Anybody can post anything. They won't do anything. And that's dangerous. That is dangerous dangerous in the era of Trumpism. That's right. Uh, And Trump is not the only tyrant out there. And uh, some of these others, as I mentioned, the Philippines and Myanmar and elsewhere um, in India now are doing great harm um, to people they don't like. And they're using these these platforms um, as a tool to do that. So. Absolutely. A bit of a catch 22. And you could say, well, then let's break them up. Let's make them less big so they can manage all of this content better. Um, but if you, but the problem that's behind that is that is the business model, right? Um, they use this engagement business model where, where they want to keep you on their sites so that they can sell data about you to advertisers. And they found that the most effective way to engage people is with divisive content, with partisan content, Mm -hmm. with content that makes people angry. Um, instead of content that, you know, would make someone want to get out and vote or, you know, do something good in their community. Um, and so they have hidden that truth for a while. There were reports that Facebook um, commissioned that showed that the divisive content drove engagement. And obviously engagement drives revenues. Yeah. And they buried those reports. Um, so, you know, we can talk for hours about this stuff because it happens every week. There, the Facebook, there's a Facebook headline every week about the way it has failed to live up to its own standards to serve the public interest. Right. Uh, and, and, they, and they enforce their standards such as they are so arbitrarily where right. Steve Bannon is still on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, but but you know, I'm suspended and I and I got suspended from Facebook once for um, somebody made a really ugly comment and I said something. It's like that's you're really ugly, and I was really? suspended for bullying, like mm. I was calling somebody ugly when I was talking about their demeanor, their 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 you know the way they acted to someone else. I wasn't calling them physically ugly which but they called me out for bullying the way it's it's obviously there's somebody monitoring for keywords and you make what would you say a word ugly used right. in a totally different context and i'm suspended for three days i mean stuff like that is just it's so arbitrary and that's why i say there should be some kind of a rule or some kind of a regulatory body overseeing this but how do you do it when it's a private company that's why i go back to maybe the internet should be a utility and 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 social networks again they're a, 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 an entity unto themselves maybe they need a special classification and they shouldn't be in private hands i don't know what the answer is is right. uh, you know, now freepress.net you guys are saying that that trump's suspension from facebook should be permanent now there yes. are uh, some other people that i know who are you know good liberals even who are uncomfortable with that saying well if they right. can do that to him they can turn around and do it to us. I mean, I'm looking at some of the the right winger comments on social media about Trump's suspension. And, you know, Mark Meadows, it's a sad day for America, a sad day for Facebook, because I could tell you a number of members of Congress are now looking at do they break up Facebook? Do they make sure they don't have a, a monopoly? They're talking about there's this censorship of the right. But meanwhile, nine of the top 10 Facebook posts and sites are, are, are conservative. So you can't even qualify it that way. No, you can. And, and, and the First Amendment free speech issues are sort of backwards in this no. case, because mm-hmm. um, obviously the First Amendment prevents government censorship. Um, um, 
Facebook is not the government. In no, fact, I- in the scenario with Trump, the government representative in that conflict <laughs> was Donald Trump. Right. And Donald Trump, uh, as a result of, of being um, having uh, some of his tweets corrected, and Twitter was doing that with his tweets before Twitter banned him. Right. Um, had proposed government legislation that would require that Twitter not fact check him. <laughs> and so uh, the First Amendment argument kind of falls apart when you consider that this is a private entity. And I think one of the more interesting paths that we have chosen is to try to look at better alternatives. Uh, is it possible for there to be a non-commercial social network, Mm -hmm. uh, something equivalent to what non-commercial public broadcasting is to commercial television. Right. Um, that, that doesn't have a profit incentive that, that makes these companies want to promote, um, dangerous content that harms democracy. Um, is there a way as we have proposed to tax these very large companies and use those revenues to, to, to support the antidote to the spread of lies and information, and that's public interest journalism. Right now, the Public Broadcasting Act in the United States is more than 50 years old, Mm -hmm. and it was designed to support, and throws out about $440 million a year to support public radio radio and public television. television. Sure, you know, okay, somewhat antiquated. There's There are new models for journalism, and you're a perfect example of that. Mm Um, that needs that needs funding and support as well. Should we revisit that idea um, and have a more robust, independent, non-commercial media system in the United States that's funded by through new funds, potentially through this tax of online advertising? Right. Facebook and the Googles of the world. Okay, now does that take us back to the uh, talk about net neutrality? I know when we talked about net neutrality, it was about keeping um, a, 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 some equality so that um, a company, say AT&T, couldn't charge me more for streaming my video than they charge the the guy next door or yeah. CNN so that you know the 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 theory was they're going to slow down the little guys so that the big guys who pay money more money can get a faster uh stream we lost that fight i don't know that has anything been done on that front i mean well, where are we <laughs> funny you should ask yes um it has been a very long fight because you and i have been in the trenches uh for for more than a decade now that's right uh, the fight for net neutrality to protect everyone's access to an open internet um we temporarily lost the battle during the trump administration when the trump fcc under then chair ajit pai reversed uh, a victory that we had won in 2015 that created net neutrality rules and those rules prevented um, large phone and cable companies from blocking your ability to access everything else that's online. Um, now that we have a new FCC and a new administration, one of the pledges, one of the pledges that the Biden administration has made is to restore those, those net neutrality protections. Now, we're just past the first 100 days of this administration. This was not a first 100 days priority given right. all of the other things that are going on. My goodness. Yes. And, um, and, but it is something that will be happening in the, remain, in the remainder of this year. So, so net neutrality is something that we need, to, we need to get vigilant about again and get active about again and make sure that our members of Congress and that the FCC knows that we need to restore these rights. And, you know, you're, you're the perfect person to be talking to now about this. Um, for those who aren't familiar with freepress.net, why don't you uh, tell them who you guys are? You've been around for a long time, what you do. Sure. We've been around for about uh, 16, 17 years. Mm. We have 1.4 million members. And the goal of Free Press is to engage people in policy debates around the future of the media in the United States, the future of journalism, the future of access to the Internet, um, our rights um, to connect and communicate without large corporations acting as gatekeepers. And we've been around for um, as I said, about 17 years, and we have a very large list of people who are very active, who write letters to their members of Congress, who call awesome. the FCC, will yeah. show up at rallies to support things like net neutrality, to support new ideas for funding journalism in the United States, and to also protest against the power of companies like Facebook 
like AT&T, like Comcast, um, that really dominate policy debates about the media in the United States. And, you know, there's so many. Again, it's been a long time since we've spoken and my list of grievances has grown (laughs) and I could go through it. I mean, from what I just told you about being suspended from YouTube and that stuff, that's got to be fixed. Number one, maybe there should be some kind of a a, a licensing process where if you're going to do an online program like this where you get you you get a some kind of a license that says yes you are you can do this you have you have access to the information superhighway and you're not going to be arbitrarily taken down by a youtube but that's it's, all right, it's that's, interesting yeah it's interesting that you you mentioned that because reporters without borders which is a global journalism rights mm-hmm. organization um has a proposal out there called the journalism trust initiative which is kind of like how you certify um, organic food, or you okay. certify, it, it's a process whereby journalism outlets um, can be certified in, uh, and, and it, they have a very elaborate process. Like so accredited, bias, like you get yeah, accredited. So that bias, it's really, it's really objective that bias, there's no political bias involved. It's really about, um, about um, the news production values of the of the outlet, um, but there is something out there that's kind of like that. It's a certification process. It's not official. When you get into this issue of licensing yeah. or government accreditation, I know for news outlets that uh, the First Amendment. You know, I know it's a it's a slippery again. slope. But then yeah. you you come upon what we have now. The FCC regulates over-the-air broadcasting, terrestrial broadcasting, which wasn't even a word when it was just terrestrial broadcasting. It was just broadcasting. FCC regulates them. Cable comes in. They are not under the uh, the, the auspices of the FCC. So a, a, a channel like Fox or OAN or Newsmax can call themselves a news channel when they they they're a propaganda channel now they right. couldn't if they were over the air if if fox was putting the fox news channel on the fox tv stations and please correct me if i'm wrong but i don't think they could get away with calling themselves news could they um they could however be, by virtue of going over the airwaves in that way, yes, um, people have the opportunity to challenge, challenge their licenses right. and all their licenses if they're not serving the public interest. And I think you could probably make a pretty compelling case that, uh, that, that based on the lies and disinformation about the election, about right. COVID, um, that those stations are not doing so. Right. There's another way, and so one of the ways that we've addressed this issue, you're right, cable channels aren't held to the same regulatory standards as broadcast television, mm-hmm. um, but we have successfully organized advertiser boycotts of Tucker Carlson's show. That's, the, right. that's why you only see house ads and my pillow ads if you have the misfortune of tuning in. Yeah, I don't, Carlson, so I don't see who his advertisers are, right. And, the, and which I don't watch, but don't, nor that's do what I. I hear here. And we've been very involved in those those advertising boycotts. But we've also looked at issues like a la carte. When we pay our cable television bill, when yes. we pay like a satellite TV bill, we get these bundled packages of channels. And Fox News Channel, One America, sometimes um, Newsmax, sometimes are a part of that bundle, which means that they're getting paid. That's they're getting right. Paid by you, the right. cable subscriber, whether you want to watch them or not. And, and Fox News, those they're called carriage fees. Fox News Ch- Channel, News Corp, Fox Television has been very persuasive in 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 extorting cable companies to pay them very large carriage fees. Wow. And of course, those carriage fees are tucked into your monthly bill. Sure. So there is the majority of cable news subscribers don't watch Fox News Channel, and they might find a lot of the content on Fox News Channel to be very. Um, offensive, objectionable, <laughs> racist, right? Um, hateful. Yeah. Um, yeah. But they don't. They're not aware that they're paying for that. They're paying for that through their cable bill, through these carriage fees. And there are ways that we can attack that. We can go after carriage fees. We can ask our cable subscribers to take Fox News Channel out of that bundle, out of that standard bundle, so that we don't have to pay. It amounts to about two dollars a month per subscriber, we don't have to pay the $2 to promote hate and disinformation. Right. We shouldn't have to. But, you know, this goes to even a bigger picture here. The media landscape has changed 
exponentially since 1996. Well, 1996 was when the Telecommunications Act was passed. It was under Bill Clinton. It destroyed my industry because at the time I was working in radio. And I Mm. remember getting a letter from AFTRA because I was in Los Angeles at the time. I was part of the union um, saying what's coming will kill our industry. And sure enough, it did. Um, It did away with the the ownership caps. It used to be uh, one company could own one AM, one FM, one television station in a market with a cap of, I think it was like seven, seven and seven overall. Well, one of the many things that the uh, Telecommunications Act did was, you know, do away with those limits. So now one company can own seven radio stations in a market plus a TV station. And now the Supreme Court just unanimously um, decided that even those those ownership limits were, were too strict. So now one company can own, I think it's like eight radio stations, two television stations and a newspaper in the same market. They could be the only owner of media in a particular city and control all the different voices but it all controlled by one, and the Supreme Court ruled unanimously that that's the way to go. What, what am uh, I missing? You'll remember these full fights over over media consolidation, where a company that used to be called a Clear Channel Communications yes. has now been rebranded as iHeart, or as media. I as I call them, I Hurt Media. I Hurt Media. That's good. I Hurt I Hurt Media. Um, you know, at one point owned more than a thousand stations, and yep. they syndicated coverage across those so that local stations local journalists um were were given pink slips because it was all you know sort of cookie cutter content um and uh, there were rules in place that now listen the fcc has never been a been a a cop on the beat when it came to enforcing rules against media consolidation even though the agency's central mandate is to promote competition localism and diversity over the airwaves it has done a very poor job of that to the point today where um women and people of color color own, own very few states. That's right. Disproportionately low compared to the U.S. population. Um, and so it's a real failing in part of the FCC. And the Supreme Court didn't recognize that. They didn't recognize this failure. And they didn't recognize that the FCC's inability to count that and act on it was, some, was something that, that it urgently needed to do. But that doesn't mean that we, we can't get the FCC to change its procedures we do have uh, a, a Democratic administration. Mm-hmm. We hope to soon have five SEC commissioners. There's still only four right. because they haven't appointed uh, uh, the third Democrat um, uh, th- that can readdress those issues. Um, and that's another priority in the work that we, we hope to get done um, during this administration. Oh, good. So I'm glad to know that you guys are on it because these are the things that make my head explode. Oh, yeah, no, I, we, we <laughs> argued that case before the Supreme Court Did you? on behalf of the public interest. Oh, wow. I should, I should have called you then because I was here <laughs> screaming about it. Like, what the hell? Really? <laughs> Sonia Sotomayor and Elena Kagan? Seriously? D- d- yeah. what, what are they thinking? How is it? I, I mean, it's uh, the whole reason for um, diversity in media is to have a variety of voices on the airwaves to say one one company can own all the different media outlets cross pollinating them from television to radio to newspaper and own every voice in town how is that democratic no i mean media pluralism and the health of our democracy are two intertwined issues and the fcc has been the agency that was uh, was supposed to provide, provide oversight um and it's a classic case of industry capture of of a regulatory body whereby powerful lobbyists at the National Association of Broadcaster um, and, and cable com- working cable and telecom companies have managed to um, influence policy making at the FCC for decades. Um, and so, you know, that's that's a central purpose of my organization, Free Press, is to is to rebalance that equation to bring the public voice back into the policy making process, and so that we don't see uh, this failure of oversight of media diversity. We don't see the ability for a single company to own so many stations, both both broadcast, both television and radio and print in a single market to the point that there there are are no alternative views. Right. Um, So, I mean, this, you know, this is a lifelong battle 
for, for a lot of us, um, myself included. I know. And, um, and, but, but, you know, we are making some progress and um, we do have some, some, we do have some hopeful signs in this, this, this new administration or newish. It's been around for a hundred days. Now. Right. Um, and, uh, and, um, and we're also very encouraged by some of the people they're appointing to make some of these decisions. So, um, well, that's good. Cause I need to hear this. Cause frankly, we're not hearing it. Maybe I need to just invite you on the show more often, Tim Carr, um, because this this is, you know, we've already seeded the airwaves like the, the 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 radio airwaves used to be, you know, when I got into radio in the olden days, <clears throat> I worked uh, out of college at WMCA in New York, which was a talk station, which had right wing voices, had progressive voices, had a psychologist and a financial guy. It was everybody on this one one station and you had a variety of, of different voices and opinions um and the fairness doctrine was still in effect and so mm -hmm. i have you know I've, i i'm a pack rat so i still have old papers and stuff and i've got responses from people that i sent letters to offering them time to respond on a certain issue um, so that we were covering both sides that doesn't exist anymore and basically the am airwaves um, is is a right wing wasteland. It used to be. Mm -hmm. You could hear Rush Limbaugh. You could get in the car in Florida, drive across country up to Washington State, and never lose Rush Limbaugh on the station. But right. you could go days without finding a liberal or progressive voice. Right. We have no voice on airwaves, so we've been relegated to the internet, which is fine. It's the new frontier. But now all these forces are saying, "Well, you can't be on YouTube, and you can't say this, and you can't play twenty seconds of a song," even though. When I do on YouTube, um, I get these uh, copyright content matches so that somebody will say, well, you played 20 seconds of my song. I, it's fine. I'm not I'm not filing a copyright strike, but I'm going to take any revenue you earn from this stream. Fine, because I make pennies anyway. So take the money, um, but don't violate my copyright. So I'm suspended. And th this is what H Henley's people apparently do. So it's just such a wild west. And there's no rules that, you know, that you know what you can do. So you don't run afoul of them. And there's no fairness. So we need something to, to right. fix the wild well, west. I think the news economy is broken. It in is a lot of ways very um, much so. it's broken not just because of the rise of the, the googles and the facebooks of the world who have stolen a, or, or i say misappropriated a lot of the advertising revenue and these are companies that don't support journalism in the old days your advertising dollar went to a newspaper that actually employed a newsroom that's right um, or a radio station that actually employed a newsroom um though that so the the economy uh, uh, the news economy hasn't kept pace with the digital age. It's broken. And we argue that that in order for journalism to survive in the 21st century, we need to rethink the economics and invest in a ro more robust non-commercial media system. We, and if you look at other countries like the UK, um, BBC, countries in, right. in Northern Asia and in Europe, they pay anywhere between 70 and 120 dollars per capita to support non-commercial media in their countries in the united states you know how much we pay per capita two cents it's not 70 dollars it's not 120 dollars it's a dollar 43. i'm surprised um, it's that much and they're always talking about cutting funding for public broadcasting because they don't see right. what they don't see the value of it it's um, woefully underfunded and i think we really need to rethink the news economics and, and make sure and there, there are proposals out there that would allow people um, to use a tax credit, for example, to, to uh, for uh, subscribing to their fa their their favorite news outlet, so wow. they could subscribe to your show, Nicole, and the, and you would receive that subscription money, and they get a tax credit for. Them. So there are a lot of proposals out there. Okay, there, good. There are even members of Congress who are taking some of those proposals seriously. Really? Um, Can you tell me who really like need. who are the champions on this? I know Al Franken was, but he's not there anymore, and. You know, uh, Maria Cantwell, Washington State, has okay. been taking a deep look at the at these things. Uh, um, there are a number of members of both 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 the Senate and the House, um, and there's some legislation that's been proposed. Some of it's better than others. Um, there's a legislation that proposes to study the issue, right, which I guess <laughs> is better than nothing. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and but we really need to mobilize people around the urgency of this issue, the need for quality 
uh, uh, news and information um, that debunks the kind of lies and disinformation that has flooded uh, the Internet. Right. And when you taking it full circle, when you go back to Facebook, part of the reason uh, Donald Trump was taken off of Facebook and Twitter was because of the lies, because of the misinformation he was putting out there and, and, and putting it out as fact. That plus, you know, inciting an insurrection at the Capitol. But the, the, the bad information, I mean, you'll get flagged if you post bad information about COVID, if you post misinformation about a candidate or something. So he should be held to the same uh, to the same yeah. standards mm-hmm. as the rest of us. Right. If, if I were to post the kind of shit that he does. I would have been banned a long time ago. Um, right. they, they gave him a lot of leeway. And so now, you know, the Republicans are screaming, oh, it's censorship of conservative voices. That's not what it is at all. But uh, but again, th- we're in the Wild West. So uh, right. this this is what you guys do at FreePress.net. I hope people go visit the site and uh, maybe support your work because we need you now more than ever. Well, we're, we're, we're keeping at it. And, um, you know, we, we understand these issues and we understand, you know, we, we've talked to a lot of uh, journalists, a lot of people like you who really been on the front lines of this issue, who really understand it in, in a very deep way because you've experienced, you've lived it firsthand. I have um, lived it. I've lived it from pre-1996 to today. And yes. It's made a huge impact on my life. Look, you know, I uh, my career was in radio since 1979. And now, uh, you know, I, look, I, I wouldn't change anything. At least here I can do and say what I want. I'm making about, uh, you know, an eighth of what I used to make in terms of income, I'm barely getting by. But at least I have my integrity and I'm not, uh, you know, I, I don't have some clear channel i hurt radio overlord telling mm. me what i can and can't say but still it you know i have i have youtube saying but you can't say it on our channel anymore um yeah there, right. there's got to be uh, there's got to be a better way so right. and, and it's you know it's the, the the fact that you have a dependency on you know and i'm not, you know i'm not saying this is a bad way right. you have a dependency on youtube of course you have a dependency on facebook you have to go there because that's where the people are. Exactly. Just the reality of that situation. That's problematic, right? Because these are not good companies. No. Um, they're not accountable companies. Uh, they don't subject you to due process. They make arbitrary decisions. That's right. They allow tyrants to have a voice because in Mark Zuckerberg's understanding of things, um, you know, they have a different standard for content moderation for the likes of Donald Trump than they do for normal people that that kind of up, up turns the whole idea of journalism right the yes. idea of journalism is that you give voice to the voiceless not uh, give those you know, donald trump's not being censored not at all he, he maybe kicked off of facebook but he has he can walk up to any podium anywhere and have journalists and he could journalists. go over to fox and have a, a right. huge audience any hour any day yes. This is not a voiceless in- individual. Right. Um, some of us at times wish he, he wish were. He were voiceless, <laughs> but he has a podium wherever he goes. Right. Um, and so, I mean, when we think about censorship, let's really think about who the victims are. And it, it's not people like Donald Trump. It's no. not people like any of the prominent conservatives, like Ben Shapiro, nope. who are crowing, or Ted Cruz, who are crowing about this issue because they've done... Um, the focus grouping, and they know that this kind of cultural war, this kind of issue about elite Silicon Valley billionaires censoring, um, you know, uh, everyday conservatives um, generates, I don't know, money, I guess. I um, guess. So they, they keep at it. They're, and then they keep at it, even though there isn't an ounce of truth to any of it. So. Right. And But you know who's being hurt by this? The people who you know, turn to Fox or or Breitbart for their news, who don't understand that that's one voice, that you need to get a variety of voices and make your, you know, come to your own conclusions if you want to listen to that kind of crap, um, because it's not news, it's propaganda. And they're the ones, 70% of Republicans believe that, that, that Donald Trump won the election and Joe Biden stole it, because that's what they're being told by a channel that calls itself news. That's who's being hurt. We all are. Yes. Um, and again, 
you know, people need more choices. We yeah. need more, more diverse ownership of the media. We need more robust um, uh, funding of non-commercial independent journalism. Um, we need to rethink the news economy. We need to protect the open internet so that everybody has access and large phone and cable companies can't decide what websites you go to and what websites you can't go to. Exactly. Um, you know, there's a raft of issues, but they all revolve around this idea of ensuring that our media system promotes uh, uh, a diverse, multiracial, democratic system. Which it doesn't uh, right now. It does it not. It doesn't right now. And there's a history that shows, shows that, you know, systemic racism has been a problem within traditional media as much as it has been a problem within other industries and institutions. And, and so we have a reckoning too on a lot of fronts. No kidding. Um, no kidding. But, um, but we're doing the work. Good. I'm so glad to hear it. So um, <laughs> freepress.net is where they're doing the work. So go support them if you're in a position to do so. Tim Carr, it's great to catch up with you. I'm sorry I threw oh, a did. lot on you today because, yeah. I, again, we haven't spoken in a while. I, I, I hope to rectify that. I hope you'll come back more often and it, because these are it. really nice important. To catch up. Great. Me too. Thank you so much. We'll talk. We'll talk soon. Appreciate it. You too. Bye bye. Uh, Tim Carr, uh, one of the really good guys. Find him on uh, Twitter at Tim Carr, T-I-M-K-A-R-R. And yes, do follow freepress.net because they do great work. And again, uh, we weren't kidding when he said we've been at this for well over a decade. I mean, this goes way, way back and it's only gotten worse. So I need to I need to stay on him <laughs> to, uh, to make sure we're getting, you know, the, the attention. But I, they're doing the work, whether I harp on him about it or not. All right. Um, hey, uh, you know, I know I guess Donald Trump issued some kind of statement about, uh, you know, the Facebook ban. Um, but I have a secret weapon and was able to get um, a, a video, a personal video of Donald Trump's freak out about uh, the Facebook thing. And I know, look, I hate to assault your ears, but really this one is worth listening to. So um, what's the matter, Donald? You has a sad today? So this morning, your president and still your president was just having a nice breakfast, you know, sitting there and Uber Eats delivered me a very powerful selection of sausage egg McMuffins, which normally I don't like my breakfast sandwiches to be sort of kind of biracial. You know, you've got sort of the white muffin and the almost triracial with sort of yellow egg and then the African-American sausage. Relax, Mike. Okay, it's just, I'm just talking about the food. And then I'm eating it thinking everything is okay. And then somebody comes in and they say, sir. And I go, what do you want? And they said, you've been banned from Facebook and Instagram again. And I said, you know, these radical left social media companies, it's such a disgrace, you know, cause now I can't communicate in the DMS on Instagram with the models, uh, the big breasted ones, not the ones with the large booties. I save that for Ben Carson, but this is so typical. Okay, so we're going to have to, you know, we're probably going to have to storm Facebook headquarters. Okay, my great patriots, bikers for Trump, hackers for Trump, uh, and, a, you know, our most powerful cyber group, the people who get mad at their computers and smash them against the floor because they're stupid for Trump. We're going to have to form a very strong coalition that'll make January 6th look like Woodstock. Okay. So we're going to meet up, follow me. We're going to Facebook headquarters. I'll meet you down there. And we've got to fight for a democracy, for our internet. Okay. Soon they're going to be telling you, you can't access all sorts of other things on the internet. Okay. They've already done such horrible things to our friends at Pornhub and we got to fight. We have to fight or we won't have an internet again. So I'm going to go continue my strong McDonald's breakfast and I'll meet you at Facebook headquarters uh, later today. Okay, so bye bye and we'll see what happens. Uh, in case you were wondering, that is the comedy genius of J.L. Coven, who does still does the best Trump. Not that you want to do a good Trump, but 
you know, um, when you want to make Trump say the things you want to make him say, you go to J.L. Coven. All right. Um, hey, our friend Bruce W. Nelson, also known as Mangy Fetlocks, has a little song for Donald Trump. I, I, I think it's time we hear that. Uh, take it away, Mangy. <laughs> Wild Dems have got a donkey as a mascot, I have thought. That makes no sense to me at all, alas. For down at Mar-a-Lago, the Republicans now keep what well may be the world's biggest ass. They gather there pathetically to kiss his hairy rump. He grins like an old jackass when they do. While Dems may have a donkey, GOPers have a Trump. The donkey's the more pleasant of the two. <laughs> Somebody should tell Ted Cruz. <laughs> Somebody should tell Ted Cruz. I guess, you know, he, he was with uh, Donald last night at Mar-a-Lago because everybody's going to kiss the ring. One more thing. You know, they're driving uh, Liz Cheney out out of leadership. Um, I am no fan of any Cheney, but I tell you, I found some, I got newfound respect for Liz Cheney because at this point she's saying she knows they're, they're trying to kick her out of leadership, that, that it will get done. Um, but um, she said she's not going to fight back because if it means that she can't tell the truth, that she's got to participate in this big lie, then let them kick her out. So good for her. Again, um, this just shows that we can find common ground even with the people we most viscerally disagree with. But speaking of, of uh, Liz Cheney, or Cheney, um, Mangy has a song for her, too, and the Republicans. Howdy, folks. Mangy Fedlock's here. Republicans are sick to death of their colleague Liz Cheney, who had the nerve to go and be both female and quite brainy. The rule among Republicans adhered to down the line is they should all share Donald's brain together at one time. The idea of having your own thoughts as with Miss Lizzie, Kevin McCarthy says makes him lightheaded and quite dizzy. Kevin's never actually had a thought, so you just can't even imagine what it's like. So boldly the Republicans will squelch the rebel is because the truth can only be what Donald says it is. There you go. Mangy Fetlocks, everybody. Thanks for listening. Sure. Thank you, Mangy Fetlocks, also known as Bruce W. Nelson. This guy, I believe he was a music teacher. I made the mistake when I first discovered him on YouTube. I thought he was Jeff Daniels because he looks like here. Look, doesn't doesn't this look like it could be Jeff Daniels for those of you watching on video because Jeff Daniels plays guitar and sings, too. I was convinced it was Jeff Daniels doing a character and I played one of his videos and I'm like, he doesn't say Jeff Daniels anywhere on the site, but I promise you it's him. And I get an email from Bruce W. Nelson saying not Jeff Daniels. <laughs> so um, I did a huge mea culpa. I was wrong, but he's great. And so I made a new friend and he does, he posts like two of these songs every day on YouTube. And they're, they're spot on in terms of commentary. Um, and musically, he's excellent. He plays guitar, he plays keyboards, he sings. Um, you see what happens when you, you know, you explore the, the YouTubes, you mine it for <laughs> great talent. That's what I come up with. I do this to keep my sanity because with, you know, uh, things are better with Biden. Things are better in, in the days, you know, post Trump, but he's still out there. He still has, he's the head of the Republican party, which blows my mind because he lost the election. He lost the Senate, didn't get back the House, and any other year, the candidate, the, the, the failed presidential candidate, would just ride off into the sunset, but not Donald Trump, because he's Teflon. Unbelievable. And I do fear that he will um, rally his MAGA troops and, and, and come back. And if he does, we are fucked and not in a good way. Um, there's one breaking news story that happened this afternoon that I want to share with you. That's awesome. Um, uh, the Biden Harris administration today announced that they would support waiving 
intellectual property protections for COVID-19 vaccines. That's huge. And what happened was, oh, let me see if I can't find uh, the, the data on this. Um, the the um, pharmaceutical stocks took a massive dump, or as we call them in our house, a Trump. Um, they did. They, they dropped precipitously. And of course, now I can't find um, that, uh, that, that, that chart here. U.S. backs waiving patent protections for COVID vaccines, citing global health crisis, which is a good thing. So that now these developing countries who can't afford to pay the ridiculous, um, uh, you know, patent fees to get the vaccines don't have to worry about it. Right. Such a waiver could remove obstacles to ramping up the production of vaccines in developing countries. Uh, the move comes as coronavirus infections surge to their highest levels in countries that have struggled to procure or distribute vaccines. Well, <clears throat> The major um, pharmaceutical company stocks <clears throat> took a nosedive. Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, not quite so much, but they all dropped. And you know what? Good. Serves you right. And I got to say, we, the taxpayer, helped finance the research and development. And, and for those of you who, and, and I got to put Randy Rhodes in here, too. She, you know, she went on. I heard a little bit of her show yesterday when she was freaking. I, you know, I don't want to get it, and it, it's an experiment. No, it isn't. This mr with the mRNA. I, I know I'm screwing it up. The kind of vaccine that Pfizer and Moderna use these um, uh, the the RNA things. It, these have been in development for many years because. It, it, the COVID-19 is a novel coronavirus, but it's part, it is a coronavirus. And that's what they've been working on. And this is new technology that is wiping this virus out. It's irresponsible not to get the shot right now. Irresponsible. And I don't care if you're scared of the needle or you're afraid of the side effects. You do the right thing and you take the damn vaccine. Anyway, the, um, the the U.S. trade representative, Catherine Tai, who um, was widely applauded upon her nomination and confirmation by progressives. So we like her. She's she's on the right side of things. She issued a statement. Here's what she said. This is a global health crisis and the extraordinary circumstances of the COVID-19 problem pandemic call for extraordinary measures. The administration believes strongly in intellectual property protections, but in service of ending this pandemic, supports the waiver of those protections for COVID-19 vaccines. We will actively participate in text based negotiations at the World Trade Organization needed to make that happen. Those negotiations will take time, given the consensus-based nature of the institution and the complexity of the issues involved. The administration's aim is to get as many safe and effective vaccines to as many people as fast as possible. As our vaccine supply for the American people is secured, the administration will continue to ramp up its efforts, working with the private sector and all possible partners to expand vaccine manufacturing and distribution. It will also work to increase the raw materials needed to produce those vaccines. So that's a good thing. And in case you're wondering, there was other news today. For instance... You know, you win one, you lose one. Here's one we lost. Uh, a federal judge vacated the CDC's nationwide eviction moratorium that was enacted during the pandemic to protect people who lost their jobs and had no money coming in and couldn't go out and get work. And this is leaving many Americans in danger of being homeless. The CDC imposed the ban in September. Biden extended it until July. But this judge, Friedrich, today questioned the CDC's authority to impose such a, a, a moratorium and, and did away with it. So, again, it's a one step up, often two steps back. Hopefully we'll reverse that. So it's two steps up and just one back. And then we can keep moving forward. But get vaccinated. If you haven't been yet, do it. My kid got her second shot yesterday. So we're on our way. And, um, you know, we're, we're up against the odds because too many idiots listen to Fox and OAN and, you know, are, are anti-vaccine. So um, we're fighting a huge disinformation campaign. Um, and at a time when we need truth. John Lennon said it. Give me some truth. 
All right. With that, we come to the end of an hour. Thanks for hanging with me today. Tomorrow, um, yeah, I've got two interviews that are recorded today for the rest of the week. So we have uh, Stephanie Kelton coming up, and we have the authors of this book, Driving While Brown. We'll figure it out. But be here. We've got good shows coming up for the rest of the week. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Sandler's What's News from NicoleSandler.com and the Progressive Voices Network. The Republican Party dominates the headlines today and not in a good way. First, there's the feud in the House where Speaker-in-Waiting Kevin McCarthy and his top sidekick Steve Scalise are working behind the scenes to oust Liz Cheney from her leadership role as conference chair and replace her with Trump loyalist Elise Stefanik. They could schedule a vote as soon as next week. The reason for the unprecedented action? Cheney had the nerve to tell the truth about Donald Trump and call out his big lie claiming that the November election was stolen and that he fomented the insurrection on January 6th. In a scathing editorial Wednesday morning, the Wall Street Journal excoriated the party for ousting Cheney from leadership because she's daring to tell the truth. Quote, Republicans should find a way to speak this truth to voters in 2022 and quickly turn to running on an agenda for the future that will check Mr. Biden and his cradle to grave entitlement state. Purging Liz Cheney for honesty would diminish the party. The newspaper also called out McCarthy for coordinating her takedown when he, quote, knows Ms. Cheney is right. The election wasn't stolen. Then there's the investigation into Rudy Giuliani. On Tuesday, federal prosecutors asked the judge to appoint a special master to examine all the evidence taken from his home and office last month. And yet another shoe dropped on Tuesday as U.S. District Court Judge Amy Berman Jackson rejected the Justice Department's attempts to withhold the release of a secret memo. The memo was written for former Attorney General William Barr regarding the department's opinion not to charge Donald Trump with obstruction at the end of the Mueller investigation. The judge dismissed the DOJ's reasoning that the largely redacted memo from March of 2019 was legal reasoning to help Barr make a decision about Trump. She said she believed Barr and his advisors had already decided they would not charge the president with a crime, and the memo was partly strategic planning and therefore could be made public. The decision adds to the criticism federal judges and others have had about Barr and his handling or mishandling of the Mueller probe and his desire to keep documents related to the investigation under wraps. The DOJ has until May 17th to decide if it will appeal her ruling or release the memo. Well, President Biden has a new COVID-19 goal. That is to have at least one vaccine dose in the arms of 70 percent of U.S. adults and 160 million fully vaccinated by July 4th. That would mark a sharp slowdown in the vaccination pace, but that's been happening across the country already. So far, about 145 million people, that's about 56% of all adults in the U.S., have gotten at least one dose, and states are gearing up to vaccinate 12 to 15-year-olds once the FDA approves the Pfizer vaccine for that group. And not only that, Pfizer said it expects to apply for emergency use authorization for its vaccine for children ages 2 to 11 in September. It also plans to file for full approval from the FDA for use in 16 to 85 year olds, which could help alleviate some Americans vaccine hesitancy. This just in, the much-anticipated decision on Donald Trump's future on Facebook was released Wednesday morning by Facebook's Oversight Board. 
On CNN, Brian Stelter announced the decision. The board has upheld Facebook's decision to restrict then President Donald Trump's access to posting content. So in other words, Trump remains banned from Facebook. He will not be allowed back on the site. This is a remarkable example of a private platform run by Mark Zuckerberg making a choice about a world leader, now a former world leader, and this is going to have ramifications for other world leaders and for other cases in the future. Facebook was the first major social media platform to suspend Trump indefinitely in the wake of the January 6th attack on the Capitol. And its decision was met with praise by some and decried as censorship by others. Just so you know, the Facebook Oversight Board is a group created by Facebook to which users can appeal important company decisions. It's funded by a $130 million trust created by Facebook, and the board said it is an independent and neutral third party whose goal is to review moderation decisions made by the company and decide whether they were made in accordance with its stated values. So far, the board has ruled on Facebook moderation decisions around blackface, threats of violence, and COVID-19 misinformation. It has overturned Facebook's decisions six times, upheld them twice, and was unable to complete a ruling once. And I guess now we can say it upheld them three times. Well, we knew he'd appeal. And here it comes. Derek Chauvin's lawyer on Tuesday filed for a new trial for the former Minneapolis police officer who was convicted of second and third degree murder and second degree manslaughter for the killing of George Floyd last May. The lawyer, Eric Nelson, argued that several factors prevented a fair trial, including prosecutorial misconduct and the judge's decisions against moving the trial and sequestering the jury or granting a new trial due to publicity that intimidated defense expert witnesses. Nelson also alleged jury misconduct. As I said, the motion was widely expected, but appellate courts generally set a high standard for granting new trials. From the Groundhog Day files, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has again missed a deadline to form a new government, extending the country's long political deadlock. The mandate to form a new government goes back to President Reuven Rivlin, who now must decide which of Israel's other political leaders he might entrust with trying to form a governing coalition. Israel has gone through four elections in the past two years, and not one of them has resulted in a definite governing structure in the Knesset, Israel's parliament. One name to look out for is Naftali Bennett. He's a former defense minister and right-wing party leader. Both Netanyahu and another major party leader have offered Bennett the prime ministership in a sort of rotation deal. Bennett says he's not opposed to forming a unity government made up of a wide selection of parties. Well, the race is on in Florida. Charlie Crist on Tuesday announced his bid for governor, a position he once held as a Republican. He's now in his third term as a Democrat and congressman. After Crist announced, Florida Agriculture Commissioner Nikki Freed stopped just shy of officially declaring her candidacy, too. By the way, after the death of Congressman Alcee Hastings, we're waiting for the governor to schedule a special election to fill his seat. For reference, after the last Florida congressman's death in 2013, a special election to fill the vacancy was held less than five months later. This time, after the death of Congressman Hastings, Ron DeSantis is keeping the seat open for more than nine months. On Tuesday, DeSantis announced the primary will be set for November 2nd and the general election will be January 11th. Supervisor of elections for Broward and Palm Beach counties had proposed August 31st as a special primary date and November 2nd for the general election, which would have meant replacing Hastings 11 weeks earlier than DeSantis is doing it. Of course he did. I got the and that's just a bit of what's news for now. I'm Nicole Sandler. If you appreciate these reports and the Nicole Sandler Show, I hope you'll consider making a contribution. My work is 100% listener supported and I can't do it without your help. Find out more at NicoleSandler.com and please click on that donate button.